Welcome back everyone. The new year is finally over and that means first off everyone is back in work and second off the casinos are back open. We're starting off 2024 with the S&P down half a percent which doesn't matter too much but what matters more is Apple being down 4% and the rest of the Magnificent 7 not far behind. It's the beginning of January and that means it's time to do another monthly update to my M1 Finance Fund. We'll also spend a little bit of time going over the covered calls that I opened on my Alibaba and PayPal positions. And we'll finish the video with a few minutes going over Wall Street bets, losses, and finance TikToks. We've got a lot to discuss today, so let's get right in to the M1 Finance Fund update. And just to catch everyone up really briefly, the purpose of this fund is to every month find marginal businesses that may be struggling but are very cheap put them into a diversified portfolio, and then update that portfolio every month, holding each month's update for a year. So the selection of stocks that I add today will be diversified into the existing portfolio and then sold, removed in one year. This portfolio has done phenomenally well the past year, turning $6,000 January 3rd, 2023 into $18,500 now with no cash inflows. All the way up until October 1st, it was holding Meta Platforms. And then starting October 1st, when I thought that Meta Platforms had reached a relatively fair valuation, I changed into the diversified, deep value cash flow focused approach. And that approach thus far, the past three months, has actually been outperforming Meta Platforms bounce back over any time frame the past year. So our first step here is looking at the investable universe for this M1 finance portfolio. And that's gonna start off with looking at the Magic Formula Stock Screener, which ranks stocks based off of their earnings per share yield and generally the return on capital. I like starting here for my investment universe for companies to look at because I know that these companies are going to be relatively cheap on the earnings per share yield. And they're also going to be relatively good at deploying capital because they're ranked on their returns on invested capital. So with this list of 50 stocks, I import it into Excel and then I do my first screen, which looks for any pharmaceutical companies or biotech companies. Those initially get removed from the screen because I'm just not interested in owning those types of highly volatile companies in, in this type of portfolio setup. Secondly, all foreign companies get removed because M1 Finance does not have access to those markets. And then finally, we take a look at each company on ROIC.ai just to get a sneak peek into their fundamentals, uh, the things I'm looking for to rate it in A is growing revenue of the past X number of years and a greater than 10% free cash flow yield. Uh, something that'll give me a B rating is just that 10% free cash flow yield and stable revenue. These are companies like Altria, right, ticker MO. Uh, and then third, for C, it's really discretion. If it's like, if, it, if the yield is good, but it's highly volatile company, I might give it a C rating. And D is a company that either has negative EPS for a few years or just way too volatile and something I'm not interested in or something that looks like a zombie company that I'm just not interested in owning. And after I've got them all rated, I'll rank them by the rating and then I'll apply a relative weighting to that ranking. So in this case, A's get an eight, B's get a six or a five with my higher rated B's getting a six, the lower's getting a five and then most C is getting one with a couple twos spread in. All those add up to 100%, and this directly relates to the percentage weighting in the M1 Finance Pi setup. And after doing all of this, taking a quick look at all of these companies, making sure they don't have significant debt, they're profitable, ranking them on their free cash flow per share and relative valuation, uh, we get the top rated, in my opinion, are Build-A-Bear, Crocs, Interdigital, Mastercraft, Medifast, and Pediatrics. Now, of course, you shouldn't go out and just start buying Build-A-Bear because I included it in my M1 Finance Fund. Instead, what you should realize is the deeper motivation behind this, that I believe that the general screening metrics that the Magic Formula uses, right, low EPS yield compared to the sector, and high returns on invested capital are generally good metrics that I think have a potential to outperform the S&P alone. And then if you take that initial subset of stocks, which has the potential and I think will likely outperform the S&P as a whole, if you were to sort of make an index based off of these fundamentals, and then if you take that index of good stocks that will generally outperform the S&P and you pick just the best out of them based off of free cash flow generating abilities and stable and growing revenue, I think that that provides additional alpha potentially. Uh, over the magic formula stock screening itself. Now, while the first thesis of the magic formula stocks being generally outperforming the S&P has been pretty thoroughly tested and it has at least a couple points of alpha over the S&P, it seems historically over any significant time period, the second thesis that is so far relatively untested is whether my picking stocks from the magic formula will increase or decrease their overall returns. So far, it seems like it's increasing because the returns have been quite phenomenal in the past year. But first off, I've only been running this formula for the past three months. And while it's up 30% in that time, that's still a short time frame. 
Second off, I'm not running the secondary case. I'm not taking the time to see if the initial case of magic formula stocks is outperforming or performing as well as my refined and selected selection of magic formula stocks. Now, I think I'm actually okay with this because I know that generally the magic formula index should perform a little bit better than the S&P by maybe two to 10 percentage points a year with Joel Greenblatt himself claiming that he can get up to 30%. So if I'm running this screened selected portfolio based off of the magic formula and I'm underperforming the market, the odds are that A, the magic formula itself is broken and I should find something else, or B, my selection of the magic formula is decreasing the, the edge that it has over the stock market. So all that is left from here is to stay tuned and find out. So now everyone is caught up on what's going on with the M1 Finance funds. It's time to pivot onto the Robinhood account and see how the Alibaba covered calls and the PayPal covered calls have come into effect. Now, before the stock market opened this morning, Alibaba was down like 2 or 3%, and by close of day, it was down 3.5%. And since I was waiting for the market to open, I didn't have the opportunity to sell the Alibaba covered call at that 90 strike price a year from now at $8.10, and now it's at $6.80. But that's alright, I just lost like $110 of premium I could have collected on that $7,100 cost basis for my Alibaba shares, uh, but I ended up pushing it out a month and selling the $90 call January of 2025 expiring for $7.28. So that's $728 of premium I collected, increasing my returns by about 10% for that year that I have to hold the stock. And of course, $90 is pretty close to my price target for Alibaba, so if it reaches and this call gets exercised, then I've made like 40% in a year holding Alibaba, which is nothing to complain about in my books. And I was able to execute a similar trade on my PayPal position. The big difference is that the premiums for PayPal are half what the premiums for Alibaba are. Because I guess the volatility of Alibaba, the options are a whole lot more expensive. Uh, but that's fine because I just pushed it out another year. And so I have the $85 call expiring in December of 2025. So about two years from now. And I collected $860 of premium from that. Which is about a 7% return over the next two years. Boosted onto my overall PayPal return. So again, if it reaches that $85, I get that extra 7% return per year on the underlying premium I was able to collect, plus the appreciation in share price to $85. It all looks pretty good. There's just one kind of like gnawing thought in the back of my mind, and it's that since I pushed it out so long, it's about two years until it expires. Even if it reaches $85 within a year, or like six months, PayPal's at $85, this call is going to have so much extrinsic value on it that the likelihood it gets exercised is virtually zero. And so that's gonna leave me in a weird spot where it, it's in my best interest for the call to get exercised, but there's so much extrinsic value on it that it's not going to get exercised. And then I end up having to just keep the call uh, with the losses that it has on my books, but I also have the underlying shares. So I'm not exactly sure about that. I think that it might be fine because the value gained, the extrinsic value increased on the call if PayPal goes to $85, uh, which I sold, right? So the extrinsic value increasing is money that I lose, should be mostly counteracted by the increase in the underlying share price. So I still should be fine if it reaches $85, even though the extrinsic value spikes, the underlying asset will have also spiked. And so I should be net even, even if it increases $85 sooner than expected. But that's something that I might wanna change. Uh, I might wanna pull this covered call forward uh, by that year margin. We'll just end up having to see. Anyways, uh, so that's just something that I'm going to have to continue thinking about and pondering what the implications are. Again, I have virtually no experience selling covered calls. So this is a good learning moment for me. And another thing to keep in mind here is that of all the money that I manage, about like, you know, 11,000 is tied up in my 401k that I can't access. I can't change the investments. The other partition is tied up in M1 Finance, right? That's like 18,500 now. And that leaves this 26,000 here in Robinhood and another 26,000 in Thinkorswim. And in both Robinhood and Thinkorswim, the really only large positions I have are these 144 PayPal shares in Robinhood coupled with the 100 shares of Alibaba in Robinhood, and then I have 7,000 in Alibaba in my Thinkorswim account, and 7,000 in Dick's Sporting Goods in my Thinkorswim account. Now, the other thing is that the Dick's Sporting Goods shares are already, already up like 40%, so I'm already thinking about exiting that position and moving it to something else. If I do that, of my $50,000 invested, I'll have like $9,000 in PayPal, and like $12,000 in Alibaba, and then the rest just sitting there, like 30K just doing nothing effectively. So I think it's time to do a little bit of New Year's cleaning, clean up all the just random options that I have in my Robinhood account, and really settle down on underlying shares and valuable, undervalued companies with their covered calls, 
and go forward from there. So that's what you can expect seeing the next week, cleaning up the account, really organizing the different brokerages that I have, hopefully into one. Uh, but that's enough about investment talk in terms of what I'm investing in. Now let's look into finance TikTok and see what's going on there. This is just a reminder that if you had $500 in your trading account and you compounded that by 2% every single day, at the end of the year, you would be left with $86,000. Now, if you started trading with $86,000 for another year and compounded that again by 2% on a daily basis, you'd be left with $14 million. That's a lot of money, guys. I mean, like, when it comes down to it, this isn't the worst, most obnoxious finance video that I've seen on TikTok. It's, like, strictly speaking true, but obviously no one's going to make 2% a day. And, uh, wait, b before I cast judgment on this, let me see if this person's selling a TikTok course. That'll be the verdict. If this person has a TikTok course that they're selling, then I'm going to get mad. 